Welcome and um, and thank you for joining our, uh, the Brown Registry Group today um, and uh, welcome to our first in the series of 2020 uh, Dot Brand Vision webinars. Um, so um, I sincerely hope that all of you are keeping well and staying safe during this pandemic and obviously uh, we would have preferred to have seen you face to face during one of our brands and domains events or ICANN related uh, face to face meetings. Um, but obviously for the foreseeable future, that's not feasible. Um, so with that in mind, we prepared a, a series of webinars to keep in touch with you all. So um, I am Martin Sutton. Um, I'm the executive director for the brand registry group or BRG for short. And the BRG is a non-profit uh, trade association for members that operate a brand top level domain and for organizations that intend to apply for their own, uh, to operate their own brand TLD in the future. Um, we support our members' interest in the domain industry, so particularly in ICANN, and we also provide a unique um, network, if you like, for our members to engage uh, share experiences and uh, their knowledge and that helps in turn our members to derive more value from their dot brand. Now with our 2020 dot brand vision webinars uh, we intend to spread these across June and July and uh, these will include presentations uh, from our members relating to their individual experiences uh, to migrate across to a dot brand environment and other specific topics such as uh, managing SEO, uh, a particular issue for marketeers to, that concerns them, um, but um, we'll be able to, to demonstrate how, how effective that can be done. And we'll also take a look at broader uh, strategy and business case development uh, for integrating a dot brand into an organization's uh, digital and online objectives. So. Um, do keep a lookout for, for more information. Uh, we'll be sending that around shortly, um, so you'll be able to keep track of uh, the, the future events as well and the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, now, in this first uh, uh, webinar of the series, I am pleased to introduce you to Tony Kirsch, who is the uh, Head of Professional Services at Newstar and also one of the BRG's uh, board of directors. Uh, those of you familiar with Tony will know he is a great advocate for dot brands and he's been tracking their developments with interest and enthusiasm. Uh, so I'm delighted he's been able to join us today and bring us up to date with what has been happening industry wide. Uh, now I say join us, uh, Tony is based in Australia, so it would be particularly unfair to drag him out of uh, bed at these early hours, um, so to avoid the headache of tackling the time difference. And we did take the opportunity to prepare um, this as a recorded section of the webinar, um, so at least he could enjoy a peaceful night's rest. Um, now, during the uh, presentation, please do feel free to post any questions you have um, into the chat. Um, and at the end of uh, Tony's presentation, uh, we'll have an opportunity then to uh, cover those in a Q&A session. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to try and switch on Tony. Uh, so bear with me just one moment and uh, we shall hear from him. And hello, everyone, uh, wherever you may be uh, listening to today's webinar. Um, we've been talking about these uh, webinars for quite a while now, um, for those of us on the BRG board. And, it's very nice and in fact honoured to be asked to present the first one of these today, which we're going to call um, Dot Brands State of the Union. We want to give you, um, our members, just a bit of a snapshot of what's happening in the, in the industry. Um, like me, many of you I'm sure are working from home and dealing with a very unique um, situation um, that, that's, uh, that's impacting us all. But uh, I hope that you're all safe and well. And I hope that you find this um, webinar beneficial as we sort of go through a little bit about what's been happening in the Dot Brand world. Um, over the realistically, the last five or so years since um, since we really started to hit uh, mainstream now. Um, I wanted to just give you a quick little snapshot here about um, uh, what I see as this uh, consistent trends that we're looking at. 
And one of them is that we've usually got to pay attention. I'm going to show you some stats in a moment. Just the consistent growth that we see in the dot brand industry. Um, and it's fantastic. You know, many of us have had challenges. It's been difficult working with ICANN and a variety of other things. But um, if, we, if we sort of step back and, and, and look at this as, a, as an industry, a very consistent improvement. Now, we're not seeing anything crazy, but we're just seeing consistent movement from, from many of the um, dot brand owners around the world, which is fantastic. And to the second point around here, I think you're starting to see some of the bigger brands get on board. Um, you know, obviously in some cases, the bigger the brand, the, the, the more difficult it is to, to, to move away from you know, your existing um, website and domain name strategy. But it's been really interesting to watch over the last 12 to 18 months, the bigger brands starting to get on board and finding, as I said here in the third point, a really broader range of uses for the dot brand. I think if we follow the evolution of dot brands over the last four or five years, we've sort of had a bit of an approach where it was uh, perhaps a little technical and then moving more into the marketing, marketing and communications angle. Um, and I think my experience of this is that we're starting to see it actually drift a little bit further back. I'm going to give you some examples of what's going on um, in what I see every day. Um, but I think that we're starting to see that brands really be used uh, a little bit more on the internal side, a little bit more to do with security um, than perhaps what we've seen to the extensive growth that we've seen in, in marketing communications. So let's have a quick little recap. For those of you who remember that we had just under 600 applications for dot brand uh, TLDs back in 2012. And for a variety of reasons, um, we've seen over 50 of these being um, withdrawn or on hold. And many times, you know, I'm here, I hear a lot of people sort of talk about that as a negative number. I think the reality of this situation is that uh, many applicants did so um, without a really clear game plan as to what they were going to use their dot brand for. And certainly many applicants did it with a little bit of fear around their trademark. So on one angle, you look at those numbers and you say, okay, well, that's a lot. And obviously we're left, if you do the maths very quickly in your head there with 536 in existence on the web today. I actually look at it a bit differently. I think that it's amazing that we'd be able to create some value propositions and some good support for the industry um, through group organizations like the BRG um, and, and find a very small number comparatively of, uh, of applications that have, um, that have no longer proceeded. So the, as I said, 536 um, in, in 2020. And interestingly, we are probably a few days away from hitting 20,000 domains being registered in those um, top level domains. So if you do the rough numbers, it's about 35 domains per TLD. Um, you know, that's pretty surprising, you know, that to, to see that um, we're getting to 20,000. It's been a very consistent growth pattern. Um, and I wanted to sort of show you what that looks like, you know, since we went back and started this in 2015, you'll see some pretty consistent growth. When we do our reports um, uh, here at Newstar, on average, it's about 20% each year that we start to see growth in, in the number of top level domains that are being used and also the number of domains that are being registered in those top level extensions, which is pretty interesting. You know, you can start to see people not necessarily wanting lots and lots and lots of domains, but many organisations getting in that sweet spot. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Of the domains that are registered, um, of course, not all of them are working on the internet. And you can see here that on the right hand side that, uh, you know, there is almost uh, a decent chunk of that 7,000 domains almost uh, that are being uh, not yet used. Okay, so they've been registered but not haven't been um, actually uh, teed up on the internet. And we're really starting to see a shift between the resolving domains, i.e. hosting content, and the redirecting um, numbers, which can, and growing at a substantially higher rate than the resolving domains. And I think that that's for a variety of reasons. We've talked a lot um, for those that have followed our commentary around the benefits of the redirecting domains in the sense that it enables your .com or your primary website you know, for many organizations to remain unchanged. And for a lot of organizations, especially those that rely very heavily on, um, on SEO for their, for their traffic, um, in many cases, it can be difficult to have a resolving domain, whether it's a microsite or not. And it's often difficult for us, for those of us in the dot brand space to convince, um, you know, IT specialists and so on that that's a good idea. So I think you're going to continue to see redirecting domains um, be, a, be the, probably the largest chunk of dot brand registrations. Um, and I think that that also adds a lot of value for marketers, okay, because they have the ability to redirect the domains to wherever they want in real time. And of course, for a lot of campaigns, those domains can be taken down when the time's right. One of the other big increases that we've seen is the number of TLDs that are actually using their top level domain. And when I say that, I'm talking about organizations that have registered domains more so than just a, a basic NIC page, okay? I don't really think that's using it. I think that's just meeting your contractual requirements. But that number has been sub 50% for quite a significant period of time, probably right up until um, about this time last year. So to get it up to 64% 
um, shows that there are still obviously a number of people who are not using their dot brand TLDs, but that's a pretty impressive number as we move into two thirds of, of TLDs now being active on the web. And to give you an, an, an example of that, you know, 25 new TLDs were used um, by dot brands globally for the first time last year. Okay, so that's, that's important as we start to look at those numbers increasing. We're starting to see people who've previously been on the fence. And for many of you who have used your dot brand um, in the public, your work is being shared. The advocacy that we're building through the BRG, the education that we're able to share with people um, is really helping those that have sat on the fence to suddenly find value propositions and repetitive um, stories and examples that they can associate themselves to and use their TLD for the first time. I mentioned before about scaling and I wanted to just give you an idea um, as to what that looks like, okay? Um, not surprisingly, you'll see that the number of organizations that have used more than 250 top level, uh, sorry, domains in their dot brand is, is relatively minimal. But you can see that there is that sweet spot, really, if you look at the numbers sort of sub 50, a lot of the TLDs um, have using between 10 and 50 domains. That seems to be the sweet spot. You can see organizations doing more as they become more mature in their usage of it. But I thought it might be interesting to just sort of have a look and see, you know, on average, how many people uh, are registering domains in, in volume. And I think that the answers are still, you're seeing a much lower ratio of sub 50 domains per TLD as being sort of the, the industry benchmark. But of course, there's some exceptions to that. And some of them, I guess, if you look at it realistically, are skewing some of the data. You can see here that um, organizations like Devag and MMA are starting to register in the thousands. Um, and they're relatively stable. Most often you're seeing organizations do that when you see them start to branch you to, in the case of, um, of DVARG, that is an organization that's providing a domain to one of each of their consultants, okay? So this is almost like providing IDs to their staff. And that obviously starts to move things into, into volume. But there are, as you go through, even organizations, if you look towards the bottom there, like even Lamborghini, you know, 227 um, domains. I guess it's as you look at it also, it's between Mini and Seat and Audi. It's heavy in automotive. I don't know if there's a particular reason for that. If there is, I'd love one of you to reach out and tell me. But um, you know, there's quite a few organizations that are, that are breaking that norm and starting to get into the hundreds, if not thousands within their top level domain. And there are also some that are really improving and, and ramping up their usage of, of their dot brand. Um, I think more, most of interest here for me is to see the quality of the, brand, of the brands that are doing these here. You can see on the slide here that we're talking about the top end of town. We're talking about some big players. Uh, and as we all know, the more people that are using dot brands, in particular, the bigger um, organizations, um, that the better the story, the more likely it is for others to, to, to join on board. So I thought I'd just share that some of those pretty significant increases in the number of, um, of domains being used last year in 2019. I mentioned automotive before. Um, I think from a sector perspective, um, you know, it's been pretty consistent the whole time that between banking and financial, automotive and insurance, um, very heavily dominating um, the number of registrations per sector. Um, I think that there is a increasing um, awareness of security um, that in particular the insurance and the banking and financial organizations are starting to look at. Um, and I also noticed that, you know, if you look at banking, financial, automotive and insurance, probably the three organizations that uh, sectors, I beg your pardon, that would be spending as much on search as almost anyone else. So they're all continuing to look at ways of improving their brand depth, getting people out of search and into direct type traffic, clickable links and so on. Um, and I think you can see, can, you know, continue to see that. In fact, even if you look across those top 10 sectors, that doesn't change a lot. You know, over the last four to five years, it might've been up one or two, but generally speaking, those top 10 are pretty consistent um, as, as being the most uh, used um, with their dot brands. And a little, you know, I guess shout out here to my uh, local colleagues. Um, you know, some countries are growing a little faster. Okay, so, and we've got quite a lot of dot brand usage here in Australia. We're seeing it across multiple sectors in here, which is great. And as you can see here, Switzerland, Germany, Japan, and United States lead the way in terms of who is growing their usage of dot brands uh, in the fastest manner. Um, it wouldn't be a presentation about dot brands without giving some of you uh, just a few bits of information that you might not have otherwise seen about what I think are the leading examples. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit in a moment about what we do with makeway.world, World, which is Newstars. Um, dot brand specific microsite. But I wanted to give you some of the examples of what I've been seeing and hopefully some of this might resonate with you. Um, if for those of you who've been following the dot brand news, you'd be well aware that um, KPMG have moved their content, their primary domain from kpmg.com to home.kpmg. 
Um, this is a huge move. It's a global move. Um, they've done an enormous amount of work and it's been incredibly successful for them. And it's a great story for all of us, frankly, in the dot brand space. They're not the first to do it, but I think it's reasonable to say that they're the first that have done it and moved in all of their global content, including a lot of the CCTLDs and regional content onto that domain. It's an enormous project and absolutely one that they should be very, very, very proud of. Um, if you're interested to know more about that story, um, I'll tell you where you can um, get some, in, uh, some fantastic information. We've just recently done an interview with, with the team that did that there in, um, in Toronto. Uh, really insightful stuff. They're very much um, enjoying their new domain uh, and it's been a very, very beneficial project for them to, to, to embark on. So if you're interested, as I said, to know more, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, one that often doesn't get a lot of the, um, I guess, the, the kudos that it deserves is, is Google. Um, and they should be absolutely commended for their continued use of .google. You see consistent use of the .google um, top level domain. Uh, this here is just an example, one of many that I could have pulled out of their recent ones that they've done around the research. Um, they've also done ones related to the coronavirus. Again, the ability to spin up domain names in a very quick and meaningful fashion for, for Google, and they're not alone in that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but they should you know, really be commended. I would have to say that Google would be in the top five consistent quality content users of .google. And I think behind closed doors, they really like the fact that it separates them from the search within google.com. This is their ability to be able to produce new content on a new brand identity. Um, and this is another great one. I mean, we've been really screaming out for big brands to get on board. And obviously there's not many bigger than Apple. Um, Apple Music for Business is, a, is obviously a new a product area for them. As you can see, it probably doesn't relate specifically to apple.com in the sense that it's for a business targeted audience. And for many of you, that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about using your dot brand where it makes sense for it to be to a different niche, to a different product, to a different target audience. Um, this is a great site. You can scroll through and have a look at that. It's actually a very, very clean and beautiful looking site, typical of Apple with their design methodologies, um, but a great site. And again, fantastic to see dot Apple continuing to become um, part of, uh, of Apple's journey um, in their digital brand identity. And another one here that I thought was really interesting, this is a new one, I've only seen this in the last couple of months, uh, is that Fox is starting to get a little bit more product driven or service driven here in the context of, of baseball.fox. Um, you can see here, this is in fact a redirect. It does take you through to a foxsports.com uh, uh, URL. But I really like to see, this is the sort of, um, very much the methodology that we would be talking to organizations about. Very simple domains, you know exactly what you're gonna type in, you know exactly what you're gonna get. Um, and this is a really good experience for, I think for a lot of their uh, audience to not have to navigate. And foxsports.com is a great site, but it has an enormous amount of content as everyone knows. This is a really great site. If I wanna find out information about Major League Baseball, I can get to that content as quickly as I can through baseball.fox. Some of you may have seen this before. Um, we're still a big advocate here at Newstar for using your dot brand in uh, in social media. Um, I think for organizations to be able to get away from this bitly, uh, the way the, the, the brands are being presented in social media adds just an enormous amount of strength and, and value and trust um, in an otherwise very cluttered word on so, uh, world on social. So I think this is gonna be huge. You're gonna continue to see this happening. Some very large organizations there for you to, to, to see that are using their dot brand in social. And we're seeing more and more of this every, uh, you know, every month. I mentioned before also around um, domains becoming a little bit more technical. Uh, at Newstar, we have used our dot .newstar, uh, .brand TLD, probably the best part of two and a half, maybe even three years now for our email addresses. Uh, we use it for a lot of other internal stuff that I'll get to in a moment. But as you can see here, we're not alone. You're starting to see the emergence of people trying to use .canon, for example, here as their email address. Um, I think a lot of people in IT and technology are starting to understand the value of capturing that traffic avoiding some of the mistypes and really simplifying the experience and creating new identities for staff. You're gonna to continue to see a lot more of this over the next few years, I think. And I touched upon this earlier. Many of you will be um, working from home. Um, many of you will work in technology where you'll realize the complexities that are, um, that are required to actually deliver that service. For those of us who don't, you open your laptop at, your, at home and it, it works like you're in the office and you feel like it's, you know, it's nice and easy. But I can tell you from speaking to the folks that do this every day that that's not the case. There is a number of risks and uh, networking challenges that exist in allowing people to work remotely. So whether it's via VPN or other technology, you're gonna to continue to see organizations use their dot brand to help collaborate and condense 
their internal networking. The single sign-on model will continue to exist, but you're really going to start to see an evolution of um, starting to simplify the internal networking structure on the domains. And I think Dot Brands create an enormous opportunity to do that. I can tell you that right now we're working with at least four or five organisations that are in the process of doing that. I think coronavirus has been a trigger to to um, to look at that in a little bit more detail, just due to the sheer number of um, people that are doing it. But from a security perspective, it continues to add value. And I think, again, you're going to see an enormous amount of organisations move into that space um, and use their dot brand from a more internal perspective as distinct to in the marketing communications component. So with all of that said, I don't want to bombard you with example after example. Really, the point of all of this is dot brands continue to be used. You can start to see more and more examples being used across a broader sense of um, abuse cases that can be applicable to many, many organisations. Um, for those of you that are interested, I referred to it earlier about the KPMG um, interview that we've done. Very generous of them to help um, to, to share their story and you can get a copy of that at our um, domain here called brandsreport.newstar. That's available for all of you. You don't have to pay for it. It's a free download. Uh, in it, you'll find um, you know, the extensive interview that we've done with KPMG. And as part of that, you'll be able to hear this story, You know how they went through it, testing that they did, the challenges that they went through with, with their internal communications. And of course, the $50 million question, what happened to their SEO? All of that's covered in the article. I won't spoil the surprise, but feel free to go and grab that at brandsreport.newstar. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, this is the Stats Hub at makeway.world. We have a showcase of every new dot brand case that comes out. We upload all of those domains. So if you're using this and you're looking for information for your, your teams or you're trying to help create your business case, Please, it's there. We created it specifically for the for the whole dot brand community to be able to go and use that. You can search up brands, you can search up domains, you can search all sorts of things, and we'll give you as much of that information as possible. Some of which has been um, able to be used to present this um, presentation for you today. Um, I mentioned the KPMG interview. This is just one of the examples that you'll find in on on that page. Uh, we've also just published a case study with DHL. Um, interesting example where they're sort of, I guess, cross-pollinating their, their traditional business into some of their other stuff. Um, this article in particular talks about the, the dot brand and, and the James Bond uh, series. I won't spoil the surprise, you can go and have a look at that. Um, and I also mentioned earlier about um, what we've been seeing from a large number of the clients that we work with and what they've been doing in using their dot brand and relating that to their COVID-19 activities. So hopefully COVID-19 goes away, but the value that dot brands have been able to provide for those organisations that are looking for quick and simple domains that can help with their communication strategy. Um, that analysis might be really useful for, for, for some of you there already. Um, with that said, a very quick, punchy webinar. Just wanted to really give you an update on what's been happening as we all uh, sit at home. As I said, I wish you all um, health and happiness. Look forward to meeting you again on the Dot Brand Road in the very near future. But um, feel free, if you have any questions on this content, to reach out to me at, uh, at my email address on the screen. But until then, um, as I said, stay uh, safe and happy and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks very much, Martin. Okay, and thank you for Tony's uh, presentation there. So um, we now have an opportunity to uh, open up for a questions and answer session. Um, before we do, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, looking at that, um, there's a lot of progress being seen in the space that Tony has highlighted here, and such a, across uh, such a diverse uh, number of uh, business sectors as well. Um, so, whilst many of the t many of the examples uh, do tend to uh, be uh, visible use cases, Tony also highlighted there that there are some behind the scenes activities that that do occur that we won't be able to uh, illustrate and uh, um, show you, but relates to networks and particularly now at the moment when everybody is having to uh, work more and more remotely, um, the, these come into play as uh, potential solutions uh, um, for, for those uh, dot brand registries. Um, so I, I, I found that particularly in interesting and it does appear as we go on that there is a, a lot more integration um, with, with dot brands within those, those businesses um, and the different ways that they are using them in a visible means is not just uh, replacing a website or setting up uh, redirects, it's uh, also spread out to social media um, and to promote new products, new services as they develop because it's easier uh, to apply them into a, a domain space uh, that, that, that is uncluttered. Uh, 
Um, so uh, that that was very welcome. I thank Tony for his uh, for his comments there. So now I'm uh, searching through any comments. I know I've generous, generously had some responses back to Tony's uh, question about the automotive industry. Um, so Sebastian uh, Ducos, thank you for for indicating where, where you believe some of the um, traits of the automotive uh, automotive industry um, use cases are. Um, he's highly highlighted there that you know w within the automotive industry they follow uh, a, a highly distributed model where retailers are more often uh, than not separate private entities and they've been registering their own independent domain names and uh, those may or may not include the brand uh, of that particular automotive company so that can lead to confusion and uh, and problems in that sort of branding landscape and particularly in particular IP issues uh, when the reseller relationships terminate. Um, so, so in some of these cases, um, the, the brand has been able to um, look at this to regain consistency in the naming scheme and online branding. Um, and uh, to some extent it's uh, provides lots of opportunities to create just template based hosting so that that brings a lot more consistency for um, consumers um, uh, that, that want want to purchase those cars so uh, thanks Sebastian for for that input and um, <laughs> so so this is interesting I, I'll, I'll group these together uh, there's typically questions about when is the next round when uh, will brands be able to apply again in the future so um that that could be more of an interesting uh item to put out to the audience i suppose so um let, let's try this and launch a, a, a quick poll and uh, I'll give you a few moments to think of which year that you hope to see um, the new round, round opening. So uh, I've given you an option of four years. So uh, have a look at that and uh, we'll see what, see what the results give. Okay, I'm going to close it off now and we'll have a look at the results. So, um, low numbers on the early year, 2021, um, a strong backing for 2022, uh, with 65% of you thinking that might be the most, uh, most appropriate time or um, relevant time for that to open um, a few others uh, drifting into 23 and uh, a handful are uh, expecting a longer delay into 2024 so <laughs> thanks for those questions uh, uh, that that's really helpful to to see where everybody's uh, positions are on that uh, let's hope it's sooner rather than later um, okay. I think uh, what is good to see is that some of the the long-standing applications have uh, have started to, or have uh, been delegated. So um, recent news this week is Dot Amazon and its uh, um, IDN equivalents has have, have been delegated. So there are more more coming coming through. Um, okay, I haven't. I haven't got any more questions. Um, so, if you do have any um, follow up questions uh, after today's presentation, um, or you want any more information about the brand registry group, um, I've, I've posted up here uh, the email info at brandregistrygroup.org, or you can visit our website for more information there as well. Um, but please don't hesitate to. To contact me i'll be happy to help um, recordings of uh, this webinar will be made available and posted to you um, via email shortly afterwards um, so hopefully then if uh, if you want to share with colleagues that were unable to attend do feel free to forward that on and so that they can 
have a look. Um, I think, absent of any more questions, I would just like to say thank you for joining us today um, and participating. And thanks especially uh, to Tony for his colorful presentation. Um, information about our next webinar uh, will be circulated soon. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, the next one is likely to be in a couple of weeks time um, when I hope you'll be able to join us again. And I look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, uh, stay safe, uh, stay well, and uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much.